Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Josh Human. I've been working as the interim head of public engagement here at the Koffler uh, Gallery, Koffler Arts, uh, throughout the run of this exhibition, the Synagogue at Babinyar, turning the nightmare of evil into a shared dream of good. We are so incredibly delighted today to have Manuel Hertz back in Toronto, back in this exhibition space, uh, to lead us on a walkthrough, um, telling us sort of how this exhibition came to be, um, and then tell us about what, what we see in this exhibition. Um, so for those who may not know, Manuel Hertz is based in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, his practice in architecture is embedded in research, covering a wide range of typologies, locations, and scales. Completed works include a housing project in Zurich, described in the New York Times as a building that dances, a large hospital in, oh my gosh, you're gonna have to tell me, how do you pronounce Tambakunda. it? Tambakunda. in Eastern, uh, Senegal. Eastern Senegal. The synagogue of Mainz and the synagogue of, uh, for the Babinyar Memorial Site in Kiev, Ukraine, among numerous other structures. Um, I could go on and on to laud your awards and your accomplishments, uh, but we are so incredibly thankful that you've made this trip to Toronto to be here with us today, and I hand things over to you. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, thank you for your interest in, in this exhibition. What I want to do with you is, is briefly <coughs> explain maybe the, the overall setup, the, let's say, uh, curatorial concept of the exhibition. And then uh, I'll take you on a tour. Um, we'll start uh, over there at the, at the beginning uh, and then tour kind of through the exhibition because we are a slightly larger group than, than uh, um, we had uh, imagined that uh, it's maybe important that we'll stick together quite tightly and, and um, speedily with me uh, through the, in the walk through of the exhibition. So when uh, uh, we started talking about the exhibition, which is uh, a little bit less than a year ago, I think it, we started uh, middle of December uh, 2022, um, one of the first thoughts that uh, came to my mind uh, in, in terms of concept, uh, exhibition concept, was <coughs> that it should be an exhibition where you can spend 10 minutes or 10 hours. Uh, so it's an exhibition where you should be able to walk quite swiftly through the exhibition and, and get a very good kind of feel of what it is about and, and kind of the visual, get a good visual experience. But that there's also a certain kind of richness <coughs> where you can really spend a day uh, here literally a day here and, and go through everything in, in very much detail and, and uh, dig uh, into some of the areas that you're specifically interested in. And I think uh, it's, it's for you to judge whether we've achieved this <coughs> uh, kind of quality, uh, but um, what uh, was important uh, for us, and when I say us, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not the sole author uh, of the exhibition, by far not. Uh, Robert Jan van Pelt uh, came up with the idea uh, of, of uh, having this exhibition. Uh, Anthony Birkensh Birkenshaw uh, uh, was uh, our collaborator and, and very much uh, kind of uh, realized it, also in the kind of direct uh, technical and, and construction uh, 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 dimension. Uh, and of course, An Anthony, as the previous uh, director of the Koffler, uh, was very much the engine to drive it all. Um, so that's the we. Um, uh, and the we is, of course, many, many others, Josh uh, Joshua uh, included. Um, and of course, the board of the, of the Koffler that I'm very thankful uh, of. So um, the, um, the exhibition consists of various elements that are quite different uh, and kind of explore or, or lay out the, the field of the topic uh, in various also visual uh, uh, dimensions. Um, and I'll uh, quickly name them. One uh, you see here um, is a, a table that kind of gives, uh, let's say, an insight into my architectural studio. Uh, we'll walk around that in a minute. 
In the beginning uh, is the historic part that tells the narrative of, of the event, uh, the history of what actually happened at Babinyar. <coughs> we have uh, a board uh, wall uh, kind of dividing the space uh, in the center that uh, is a documentation, a photographic documentation of the, the place itself, uh, uh, of Babinyar itself in Kiev, uh, photos taken uh, a year and a half, no, uh, two and a half years ago and photos of the completed synagogue itself. On the walls you see uh, uh, these very large scale uh, photography of Edward Batinsky that uh, um, at, uh, in collaboration with, and now I have to, uh, Maxim Dondiuk. <coughs> Maxim, Maxim ac actually took the, took the photos uh, that are meant to really draw you onto the and into the site. Uh, then we'll have a magnificent large-scale model that was built in Kiev uh, and a circular uh, theater uh, video projection that will be the last thing that I want to show you. Let's follow me and we'll start here. We start with history. So, um, what you see here is a historic map um, uh, made by a German army uh, cartography uh, unit that uh, represents the city of Kiev uh, in August 1941, basically the days when they entered uh, Kiev, when the Wehrmacht uh, entered Kiev, or uh, just a few weeks before the Wehrmacht uh, entered uh, Kiev. You see the expanse of the, uh, of the city itself, you see the Dnieper, the main river, <coughs> Uh, and you see how kind of Kiev um, fades out or, or the city more or less ends uh, in this area. Uh, and it is exactly here that uh, we see an unbuilt area. Uh, if we look closely, we see also <coughs> a certain kind of topography. You see uh, texture differences in, te in texture that indicate uh, maybe differences in, to in topography. Uh, and this is the area of Babinyar. Uh, this is historically has always marked the edge of the city, the edge of the city to the northwest. Uh, and uh, it is marked by a strong topography, by gorges um, that are 50 meters deep, um, that still today are 50 meters deep. Uh, and uh, Babinyar had always been a, a, a kind of a haunted site, uh, a site of cemeteries, a site of witches, a site of, of mysterious uh, places, um, and haunted uh, it uh, remained to be, um, tragically so. so uh, but the map itself uh, is not only a kind of a recording of the city um, just uh, before the Germans took over uh, Kiev, uh, but it also, of course, is a document of this kind of uh, yeah, military planning uh, of, of the Germans as they ventured to the east uh, to, to uh, take over Eastern Europe uh, as, a, as a site of, of colonization, basically. Um, the Germans entered uh, uh, Kiev in September, I think 19th of September 1941, uh, <coughs> uh, just after Rosh Hashanah. Um, and um, a few days later, uh, um, published leaflets uh, all over the city asking all the Jews of, of Kiev to assemble at a specific uh, road crossing in northwestern Kiev uh, with their luggage, uh, with their papers, uh, and, and uh, uh, around 34, 35,000 Jews actually came to that street crossing thinking that they would be uh, moved to another location, um, but they were all shot. Um, what we see here on the, <coughs> on the walls uh, are historic photographs, um, uh, photographs that were taken uh, by a German army photographer, Johannes Hähle, uh, just uh, two days after the massacre, uh, a massacre of 34,000 people being killed in a day and a half, um, all shot. Um, and uh, <coughs> these are basically the only um, 
you know, direct testimony uh, that we have uh, of that massacre. Um, almost everything else kind of vanished. Um, and what we see is, of course, not the killing itself that has not been documented, that has not been recorded, um, but we see the kind of aftermath. And we can imagine every piece of clothing is one individual, is one person. Uh, and you see uh, an ocean of clothing. Uh, and you still see the, the topography. What we see in this uh, photograph is um, Soviet prisoners of war uh, tasked to um, kind of uh, dig out uh, the corpses, uh, uh, at least partially to cover up uh, the crime uh, as much um, as, as it was possible. Um, so this uh, uh, section, in a way, tells the, or gives testimony uh, to the historic events. <coughs> um, and it leads us to a, a beautiful um, poem um, by Vasily Gosman, who wrote, uh, in Ukraine there are no Jews. Um, and he wrote it after Babinia. Um, and <coughs> maybe on the way out or after this tour, I would really uh, recommend that you read this uh, poem because for me it's strikingly beautiful. Uh, because it's incredibly, let's say, humane. Uh, it speaks really to the human soul. It's not uh, a poem that, uh, I don't know, is, is, is about uh, um, the grandness or the, the, the or the, it, it speaks about the depth of the tragedy in a, in a deeply uh, moving way because it speaks about the everydayness of what was eradicated. Uh, uh, now we speak, uh, uh, it mentions um, uh, all the, the people who were killed, secretaries, night guards, teachers, dressmakers, uh, uh, grandmothers who could bake, grandmothers who could not bake, uh, um, beautiful people, ugly people, uh, um, but everybody's treated in a way with respect, with love, with care, with in, an individuality. And, and this is what for me is incredibly striking and, and very important. We are speaking about 35,000 people, but everybody is an individual. It's not a mass or an anonymous mass of, of, uh, of victims, but it's 35,000 individuals who all had their own soul, who all, had, who all had their own wishes for leading their lives, who all had their own language, their own identity. Uh, and, and this is, in a way, what I think this poem uh, speaks to. Uh, and that's what, uh, in my mind, makes it uh, incredibly beautiful, but also incredibly sad. Um, here we have a, a map, uh, again, um, uh, speaking about the site. The site is incredibly important. Uh, I'll get to that uh, also uh, a little bit more when we uh, go into the, um, into the kind of making of the synagogue. Um, and it's intentionally, of course, uh, kind of almost blood red. Um, it's the, the place of the massacre, uh, and it overlays the, uh, the gorge um, with the more or less contemporary city. So what you see in, in kind of light gray is uh, today's urban fabric, every building, um, <coughs> every road, uh, and, and in, in bright red is this uh, the topography uh, or the uh, kind of outline of the gorge, and it shows also how or it starts to indicate uh, how um, the topography has changed over time. Uh, and it changed, it has. Um, topography is, uh, has, since the massacre, since 1941, continuously been transformed uh, with the massacre itself, but also uh, later on. And we see how uh, kind of uh, fingers of this gorge uh, went further than what is visible today, uh, have been built over by housing estates from the 1960s, uh, by a TV and radio station, by sports clubs, uh, by a road. Uh, um, uh, but uh, so this is what you see is this kind of two uh, time zones or two uh, epochs uh, overlaid uh, on top of each other. Um, 
let us uh, uh, use this as a, as a kind of keyword uh, uh, word to transition into the exhi larger exhibition space. This table, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is meant to, in a way, let's say, reproduce a little bit the, um, my, uh, my studio, my architectural studio. Um, and what I, I wanted to draw out uh, was maybe two or three things. One is that um, the development of the design um, obviously was very much informed by history, by the events, by studying the events, by studying the ground, by studying the topography, um, um, the, let's say, the historical documents that we looked at uh, to, to um, um, inform us, um, uh, some kind of, let's say, creative inspirations, uh, and then also, um, and this is also very important for us, uh, to say that um, a design process is a, is a process that is not a, a kind of a single line. It's not that you start uh, and then uh, you take one step after a time and uh, you know already fr from the beginning where you'll end up with. Uh, so we took detours, we uh, made attempts that didn't work out well, that were ugly, uh, and, and, uh, but maybe these ugly attempts are very, very important uh, uh, to inform uh, and to shape the, the design. So this is something uh, that uh, is important about this table and then the, uh, let's say, construction process itself. Um, so uh, let me um, walk you through in more detail and maybe point out a few things. Um, we'll start with the, with the soil. Um, the soil or the topography and the soil is, is incredibly important uh, because this is where the killing took place. And, and you might have guessed it. Um, uh, but uh, um, let me uh, kind of spell it out. Uh, the, the reason why the Nazis chose this site uh, was the topography, uh, was the fact that you could kill 34,000 Jews without digging out mass graves. Uh, so they took in advantage of, of uh, the gorges um, to kind of lay layer after layer of corpses of, of people being shot uh, uh, and thereby creating a new topography, really literally a topography of death. Um, uh, and and um, this is what we have there now. Uh, so even if you now, 80 years later, dig, you find bones, human bones. Um, it's still a topography of death. Um, and uh, um, maybe jumping ahead a little bit, but all the trees that you see here are growing out of this, are growing out of this kind of topography of death, um, are maybe nourished um, uh, without wanting to be too kind of macabre, uh, but uh, are, are growing out of this. Um, and this we should always kind of keep in mind. It's, it's um, uh, sacred uh, in a way, uh, the soil. Um, so we had to be very, very careful uh, with how to touch it, how to uh, intervene in it, uh, uh, how much to disturb it. Um, but that's why we needed to study it uh, very carefully, the topography and the exact kind of formation of the site. The site itself uh, we were given uh, by the Babinyar Foundation uh, and it's this little uh, rectangle that you see here. Um, this is the site of the, of the synagogue. It's close to a, um, uh, an early memorial uh, in the shape of a menorah, of a um, um, candelabra. Um, uh, that was the very first memorial um, after independence of Ukraine, set up in 1991, uh, and specifically dedicated to the Jewish dimension of the massacre. Uh, before that, there was no memorial that indicated the Jewish dimension of the, of the massacre. Um, and this is something that uh, we very much also studied, the history of uh, memorialization. Uh, what kind of commemoration, what kind of structures of commemoration are present uh, on the site of Babinyar itself? Uh, it's a little kind of documentation of that. We studied the history. We uh, read books. Uh, uh, I, I uh, read books uh, on, on the whole history, also some kind of eyewitness reports or quasi-eyewitness reports. Um, 
uh, some fantastic literature was, was um, also quite recently uh, produced in the context of this. Uh, for example, the book by Jonathan Little, The Kindly Ones, is an incredible, um, let's say, constructed eyewitness report uh, from the vantage point of one of the perpetrators of the massacre. If you have the guts to read a really heart-wrenching uh, um, report of, of how to, how, uh, yeah, killing hundreds, thousands of people, read this book. It's, it's incredible. It's incredibly powerful. Uh, so uh, um, this was very important for me to, to, to study this very much in detail. Um, and then um, uh, I was, of course, faced with the question, what do I do as an architect uh, working on a site that is so haunted, in a way, and uh, in a context of a crime that is so incredibly vicious, uh, how do you act as an architect? Uh, and the, uh, maybe the initial reaction would have been to do something that is very somber, that is very, very heavy. Um, and we know other Holocaust memorials is, is not only a Holocaust memorial, but we know of Holocaust memorials that are very heavy, uh, and that in a way try to equate the heaviness of the crime with the heaviness of the memorial, uh, out of stone, out of concrete. Um, and I thought this is not the right response. Um, first of all, the building is a synagogue. It's not. It has commemorative uh, uh, commemorative dimension, uh, but it is not a Holocaust memorial. But certainly, it does have commemorative dimensions. Um, but I also thought this is not the right uh, way to, to react architecturally to a, a crime like that because of the poem, in a way. Uh, because there are 34,000 individuals who all had their own kind of idea of how to lead a life. Uh, and I, want to, I didn't want to reduce it to a single statement. I didn't want to reduce it to this kind of absolute statement of uh, a dark and somber and heavy uh, memorial uh, where usually you also have some kind of inscription and you're supposed to read the inscription and, and understand kind of a single message. There has to be in a way 35,000 messages or endless messages. Uh, so I wanted to do something that is much more open uh, and, and maybe even transformative. That where, where memory is not created by looking at something in a passive way, but maybe where uh, commemoration is created by actively interacting with the structure, with the building. Um, and um, I was, and, and this book is, um, guys, come closer, uh, um, uh, uh, was uh, a kind of an inspiration. It's uh, a book, um, few people will know it, uh, um, by an architect. Um, um, uh, uh, who uh, um, made a, a, a kind of, let's say, an alternative um, uh, commemorative uh, approach uh, to another site, uh, uh, the Gestapo headquarters in Berlin, uh, in a much more playful uh, manner, in a much more open-ended uh, manner, in a much more interactive manner. And this kind of opened a, a, a possibility for me maybe to rethink what it means to commemorate uh, through architecture. And maybe a little bit inspired by the fact that literally at the same time that I received the commission, um, my beautiful wife gave birth to our wonderful little boy. It was literally the same week that uh, our son was born. Um, uh, that, uh, and, and I got this commission for the synagogue, um, I was thinking in maybe different kind of dimensions and I was thinking of these kind of uh, pop-up books uh, uh, that um, they have something magic. Um, and uh, the book and the synagogue is, is an interesting kind of story anyway. Uh, now we, uh, the Jews are the people of the book uh, and uh, the, the, let's say the topic of the book has been a um, uh, a shaping uh, uh, inspiration for synagogues also in the past, um, including the one in, in that I built in Mainz is based on writing. Um, um, but I thought um, what these pop-up books contain, uh, they contain uh, something very, very powerful, uh, even in their kind of naivety and playfulness and chi childishness. Um, 
They contain this uh, power of, create, of transforming two-dimensional space into three-dimensional space. They draw us in, literally. We, we love to put our nose into them when we open them in, I don't know, museum bookshops or, or, or uh, and, and we get lost in a new universe. And I thought, what do we do in a synagogue? In a way, in a synagogue, and after all, uh, what we are designing here is a synagogue, it's in a way exactly the same. Uh, we go into the synagogue, uh, we open a book, the, the, uh, the book of prayers or the Bible, um, the Siddur, um, the book of prayers, and, and this book opens a new universe of stories, of histories, of morals, of uh, legal debates, of uh, um, uh, a kind of uh, ways of, of living together. Uh, and, and we experience this in a, in a group uh, in the synagogue. Uh, um, so I thought in a way um, uh, the, these pop-up books have share something very much with the spirit of what it is we do in a synagogue. So I thought this is maybe a great kind of motif to bring in, or why not do it quite literally? Why not make a building that opens up, like uh, uh, a pop-up book like this, that opens up uh, uh, and transforms from a two-dimensional or very slim volume into a three-dimensional space? So I thought uh, um, this could be an interesting starting point, and then we started to experiment with that, and these are literally the first uh, kind of slightly still clumsy models that we built in, in, in my office of how this could be explored, how this could uh, be materialized. Um, of course, we had no clue if it would work. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale, um, I don't know if you work in meters or feet. Uh, this is 12 meters, 36 feet. This is about 8, 9 meters, 27 feet. Um, so it's quite a large uh, uh, structure. It's quite a large building. Uh, and and um, this was in a way a challenge uh, and like I said it's a it's a route where you don't know in the beginning whether you'll really end up uh, where you want to be or, or you don't know where you want to end up uh, actually so uh, it was a challenge can we make it happen will it be some kind of clumsy structure to open it up will it be hidden will it be a vast uh, kind of clockwork hidden underneath the the floorboards uh, are dug into the ground. Uh, we didn't know yet, um, but uh, we kind of explored this uh, both three-dimensionally and and uh, technically. Um, and then um, it, it became more, let's say, specific, and we wanted to develop uh, the, the design further. And uh, we were uh, very much inspired, uh, and I'll jump um, back uh, for a second. We were inspired by um, uh, this book, um, which is um, an old uh, uh, Polish uh, publication of wooden synagogues in uh, um, in the area of of um, uh, what is today Poland, uh, Western Ukraine, Lithuania, uh, Belarusia, um, and. Um, there, what emerged there in this area in the 16th, 17th, 18th century is a tradition, an architectural culture of building synagogues out of wood. Um, absolutely fascinating. Uh, they have all been destroyed. Um, and, uh, not, uh, not a single one is still standing. Uh, it's an incredible kind of tradition, architectural uh, culture of building sacred, Jewish sacred buildings. and painting them inside uh, in the kind of most elaborate way. Uh, colorful, playful, joyful, um, full of figures, uh, texts, uh, uh, iconic representations. And I thought, uh, this is such a, a, a kind of a treasure trove. Uh, and it's all been lost. Why don't we try to link back to it? Why don't we try to uh, uh, kind of recapture uh, or reinterpret uh, this, this, this culture? Um, so we started making uh, drawings, designs for the interior, so for the inner walls, uh, these two inner walls uh, of the synagogue, how this could be. Now it's a book, so it'll be, uh, we in initially we took it very literally. Uh, 
Some of them are quite clumsy. Uh, it starts to become more refined. We experiment with colors, um, blood red. Uh, uh, thankfully, we didn't follow it. Uh, um, we didn't, uh, um, uh, very dark black, uh, also very good that we didn't follow this route. Um, and then finally ending up with something that is very close to the uh, actual design, which you see here uh, behind you, which in the end uh, was a collaboration uh, with the Ukrainian artist um, uh, and her team uh, who uh, uh, then kind of executed this. Um, I'll continue with you here. Um, this is, uh, um, uh, is the kind of technical uh, dimension uh, of it, you know, of the synagogue. After all, it's a huge challenge. I, uh, I don't know if you're uh, kind of familiar with architecture, but uh, um, um, to this has never been done before, um, a building of this size to open up completely. Uh, um, so uh, we really had to work with fantastic engineers, uh, Ukrainian engineers, uh, to, to, uh, 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 to uh, kind of develop the mechanism of how to open it, how to make it stable. Uh, look at the ground conditions um, uh, um, and and uh, develop kind of the the mechanics the organism the the kind of the clockwork uh, for for making it work and this is in a way the documentation of of all this uh, attempts and and uh, kind of developing technical details uh, uh, to um, uh, yeah to to make it uh, um, reality so in a way this, this is an incredibly, even though it looks very bureaucratic, it's an incredibly important part of the, of the project. Um, in addition to the synagogue, uh, we were asked by the client to, uh, um, to build a little uh, design and build a little uh, hut uh, that can uh, protect you when the weather is bad. It's an open synagogue, so it's, yes, it can get cold in Ukraine in the winter. Uh, um, uh, where you can uh, kind of warm up, but also for seminars, for uh, discussing uh, 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 things. And, and um, we thought this should be a little bit of a counterpoint. Uh, if this, the synagogue is wood, then this maybe is concrete. Uh, uh, and I don't want to con contradict uh, uh, what I said about concrete before, but, or about heaviness before. Um, but uh, what we tried here, and you'll see this in some of the photos, uh, is um, this little hut is cast on site. Uh, so the concrete slabs are cast on the soil, uh, and they, the soil leaves an imprint. So it's literally shaped by the soil that has so much um, kind of significance uh, uh, with the leaves and, and everything giving uh, it the texture. And then uh, the table goes into some kind of construction details, uh, 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 sorry, uh, elements, uh, detail elements of the, of the synagogue. We have a window here um, uh, that is framed uh, by, <coughs> um, uh, by a, um, a, a blessing. Um, we have the column um, that supports the, the roof. Uh, the roof weighs a couple of tons um, and the column it has a specific kind of pattern, um, and the pattern is uh, taken from the, it's the tzitzit, it's the praying scarf uh, that you wear in the synagogue, uh, and the praying every praying scarf has this kind of threads uh, where the knots are in a specific kind of pattern and numbers of knots. It's uh, these tzitzit uh, uh, are used as a means or way of, of uh, giving shape uh, to the column. And then we come to maybe one of the main elements, design elements of the, of the synagogue, which is the ceiling. Um, the ceiling, you'll see that also later uh, uh, more in more close-up. Um, again, we take, uh, we were inspired by um, these kind of historic uh, wooden synagogues. And um, often they feature also, um, we, uh, how you call it, uh, 12 <coughs> astrological signs, uh, 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 astrological iconography, uh, um, uh, kind of the calendar in a way. Uh, and I thought, uh, I, I want to anchor the building uh, in a specific kind of moment in time, in history. Uh, 
So what we did was um, we looked up what was the star constellation on the night of the killing. Uh, what did the Jews see as the last thing when they looked up into the sky? Uh, and uh, we kind of recalculated exactly the star constellation over the night, over Babin Yar on the night of the 29th of September 1941. Uh, and it is, uh, this is <coughs> kind of in north, south, west, east. This is exactly the constellation of stars. And we translated it into a painting where every star is a flower and every flower is a star. Uh, and uh, this kind of is the design uh, process. Uh, so <coughs> and then we painted it uh, into the ceiling. Uh, and in a way, it's, it's scientifically correct. Uh, 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 and it anchors the building uh, exactly in one place in time and one spot in, in, in space. Uh, now, it couldn't be moved by 100 meters in a way, because, uh, uh, but uh, it's also an expression of beauty in a way. And, and linking up to the local history, it's a Western Ukrainian uh, uh, kind of uh, iconography that we were inspired by. And, and uh, uh, so today's visitors uh, to the synagogue uh, can look up uh, and, and in a way maybe um, it gives them a, a certain kind of linkage uh, to, to uh, that uh, moment of, of, um, uh, of killing. Um, we show two videos of the construction process, one kind of aerial, a view from above, and one uh, where we um, really uh, show the construction from the view of the construction workers. Uh, the synagogue was constructed in, in the shortest amount of time, uh, uh, two, three months. It took maybe three months, four months to complete. Uh, and uh, these are the men, it's men, uh, uh, construction workers who, who did it. Uh, and this was in spring 2021. Uh, who would have known that a year later exactly these same men are fighting uh, now another war. Uh, but we also wanted to, in a way, pay homage uh, to these fantastic workers who uh, made this building possible. Um, it was inaugurated uh, um, in uh, October uh, 2021 uh, in a big uh, event uh, commemorating the 80th anniversary uh, of the massacre. Um, a cantor who was born on the day of the massacre uh, sang the kind of death uh, um, uh, prayer. Uh, and it was uh, hit uh, four days after the beginning of the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, uh, or the, the war that Russia forced upon Ukraine. Uh, it was hit, um, not the synagogue itself, but the site, uh, um, the site of Babin Yar by uh, rockets, uh, uh, Russian rockets that uh, aimed at the TV tower that stands on the site. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of a not so brief uh, um, a kind of uh, uh, explanation uh, uh, thread uh, of, of the kind of the ideas and the many threads that we took to, to design uh, the building. I want to now maybe a little bit more briefly take you through the other elements of the, of the exhibition. So here on this central wall, we have a documentation. <coughs> um, we have a documentation of the site. Um, the site as it was obviously before the war. Uh, and it shows also the kind of the strangeness of this site. It's, yes, it's the site of an unbelievable massacre, but it's also a site of everyday occurrences, of, I don't know, uh, a picnic on a Sunday afternoon, uh, um, uh, old institutions that are falling apart, uh, churches, uh, the largest uh, TV and radio station of Ukraine, playgrounds, uh, people going jogging, uh, people hanging out, uh, this kind of overlaying of so many stories of, of uh, kind of, in a way, the banality, not in a bad sense, but in a good sense, the banality of everyday life uh, um, overlaying on 
taking place on this site of, of massacre. Then, um, uh, uh, again here, I'll take you in, in many loops. Um, uh, I hope you don't get dizzy. Uh, is uh, fantastic photography of Ivan Bahn, who also took uh, the photographs of the site. Um, uh, a Dutch uh, architectural photographer who um, uh, photographed the, the synagogue <coughs> and uh, also the life uh, uh, or the way the synagogue is used. It's actually also used as a, uh, an active synagogue, uh, um, as a place of prayer. Um, in daytime, in nighttime, um, uh, and uh, ending up with the video of how the synagogue unfolds uh, manually. Uh, uh, now we said um, it's not uh, it's not at the press of a button. Uh, it takes. So we were a little bit inspired by the minyan. Minyan is uh, you need ten ten adults to to uh, hold a, um, a, a, a service. Um, uh, so it takes, let's say, 10 people to open uh, the synagogue. Uh, um, of course, it's also a spectacle. It's, uh, it's very kind of public, uh, and, and it wants to draw a general public also to, to look at uh, this uh, synagogue. Uh, the chief rabbi of Ukraine um, said uh, a few months after the opening that this synagogue has done more in communication between non-Jewish and Jewish uh, Ukrainian uh, parts of the society than, than anything else uh, in, in Ukraine to show that uh, kind of what is a Jewish uh, uh, space, what is uh, a Jewish service. Um, and then uh, come with me again. We come uh, um, to this masterpiece, uh, uh, not done by our office, uh, 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 done uh, by the team in Kiev, uh, by the um, Babinia Foundation. Uh, it's an incredible model. It's a, in one to ten scale, a scale model of the synagogue in so much detail, in so much love. Uh, I've never seen a model, uh, and, and I think I can say that it's, it's someone else's work. It's, it's incredible. I'm, I'm blown away by the uh, uh, level of detail by um, uh, yeah the the kind of beauty also uh, of this as a as a piece of model as a as a as a piece of craft. Uh, um, it was uh, built in Ukraine uh, also to kind of document the building and to show it to, for example, the president and and so on. Uh, and we managed. Um, in the middle of the war uh, to ship it uh, from Kiev to Poland, from Poland to Germany, from Germany to, to Toronto uh, uh, in a kind of loopy way. Uh, uh, and it arrived here uh, without any kind of damages. Uh, it does actually also open and close. And it plays uh, music that was specifically composed uh, for this kind of opening process. Uh, so it's really like a little bit like a dollhouse. And where this is kind of the reproduction of the synagogue, what you see on the wall uh, are Photographs, like I said, by um, uh, Maxim Danduk and, and Edward Batinsky, uh, that are meant to convey the physical reality of the site. Uh, now, I, I, when I spoke to Edward uh, in the beginning of this uh, exhibition, I said, I would love to have photography where you can see the ants crawling, uh, where you can really see kind of the worms uh, digging their way through the soil, uh, uh, where you as much as it is possible uh, for visitors to almost smell the smells of the site. And, and I think he managed, uh, or the team, um, Maxim locally, managed fantastically to, to do this. You, know, the, you really sense the texture, uh, sense the physicality of the site because it is so physical. Um, uh, and, and it kind of creates uh, the backdrop, uh, um, but also a foreground uh, to the exhibition itself. It's, uh, you can see the, the, the painting on the wall when you go out, uh, where you really see every brush stroke. Uh, and, and this is an immense quality of this kind of large scale, real size uh, photography. And what we'll end up with, and I'll invite you, and you are larger than, than numbers of seats, is, is to go into this. Um, Star Constellation uh, um, movie, uh, uh, don't be shy, uh, I'll, I'll um, <coughs> go ahead. Um, <coughs> um, 
got <coughs> so uh, you are um, we designed this uh, circular theater um, and it tells the story of the ceiling uh, it tells the story of um, and now we're at the end of the of the movie so it'll make a, it's a five minute uh, circular movie where you really um, and this is the end where you also kind of almost see the texture of the painting uh, and where you learn about the story of uh, the star constellation turning into a painting and being painted onto the ceiling. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, uh, give up my seat uh, for someone else. Uh, and uh, and uh, with that, uh, we'll have come to the end of the tour. Maybe I should, uh, uh, sorry to grab the attention again, uh, but uh, uh, there's one thing that is very important that I haven't mentioned is who actually uh, is this foundation and who commissioned uh, us, uh, who com commissioned my office. Um, and it's maybe important to say a few words. It's the Babinyar uh, uh, Holocaust Memorial Foundation. Uh, it's a foundation that is in charge of, of kind of safe keeping the site. Um, uh, and and uh, um, in uh, 2014, it launched a competition for a large museum, um, which was decided with a big kind of designed UFO-like kind of museum building, uh, 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 which, uh, at least in hindsight, was a really bad decision. Uh, and it was scrapped, uh, thank God, because the, the this big uh, kind of UFO um, spaceship uh, shaped museum dug very deeply into the ground. It's the worst thing you can do there. Um, uh, and and um, uh, then a new creative director uh, was appointed in 2018. Um, uh, and um, uh, Ilya Krzyzanowski, uh, uh, who is a, a Russian film director, and he came with a completely different approach. And his idea was, instead of building a big, big, big single building, let's rather s uh, build small and medium scale uh, interventions over the course of the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, because there's so much complexity in the site, and the site is so vast that you cannot capture it with a single building, and you need to give time uh, and opportunity to time to let the story evolve over time. Uh, and there was, uh, uh, he was then joined by an architectural um, uh, support uh, uh, kind of committee. Uh, um, one of the members is Robert Jan van Pelt. Uh, and Robert Jan, an architectural historian professor at the University of Waterloo, uh, uh, said uh, in th the first of these architectural interventions should be a, a synagogue. Why a synagogue? Uh, to bring back Jewish life back to the place where it was eradicated 80 years earlier. And instead of starting with death, you start with life, uh, which I think is fantastic. He's also a friend. He's a, uh, he recommended me to uh, the creative director. And, and uh, uh, that's how the whole story, in a way, started. So this was important, maybe, to give a context uh, to the whole project. Sure, the weather there is not that different than the weather here. How does it survive the elements? I just, I can't fathom it. It's wood, and it's open, and I, I, I'm amazed. It's, it's a very important question, and, and uh, um, it's a question that goes to the core, maybe, uh, of, of what it means to commemorate. Um, like I said in the beginning, uh, uh, usually memorials are made of, uh, especially Holocaust memorials, are made of stone or concrete. Uh, and this one is made of, of wood. Uh, and wood is fragile, as you point out. Um, and I'll first dwell on the kind of fragility before I go into uh, kind of the, the climate uh, or, or the coldness uh, in the winter. Um, uh, indeed, uh, uh, wood is fragile. But I think uh, this is maybe exactly what I wanted. Um, because with concrete, uh, you can make a memorial uh, out of concrete and leave it for the next 500 years and nothing will happen to it. And you can come back after 500 years and it'll still be the same. Uh, you can forget about it. 
in a way, literally or metaphorically speaking. Whereas with wood, you have to treat it every day. Uh, you have to caress it, you have to uh, uh, be tender with it, you have to repair it, you have to oil it, you have to varnish it. Uh, and this active interaction, uh, you also have to protect it. Uh, um, but maybe this is actually commemoration in practice. Uh, this, it, it forces you, the materiality of the synagogue forces you to constantly be careful with it. And this is maybe also what we should do with memory. We should be careful and tender with it. Wood is, you need to oil it, you need to varnish it. Uh, and <coughs> and uh, of course there's a few number of weeks uh, uh, where it can't be used, but we can always close it. Uh, and oh, it's okay. Uh, we can uh, we close it uh, once. It, so the, the 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 weekly kind of routine is now that uh, it is opened. Um, it is opened on a, I think on a Tuesday and closed on a Sunday. Uh, so it stays open for half the week and and then is closed. Uh, uh, and and this is then also a kind of a ritual uh, that attracts uh, visitors uh, and uh, if the weather is really bad then we keep it closed uh, yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, there's always people there uh, there's always people there and and um, ah you you should look uh, it, it uh, closes every, it takes 20 minutes uh, t uh, 20 minutes to open to close uh, so uh, yes 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 uh, absolutely, and and uh, so if suddenly a storm uh, comes out, then we close it. Mm. And yes, in the winter it's cold. Take a jacket, and if it's really cold, then uh, we go somewhere else. Great. Do we have any other questions? And just reminding you, you really have to speak right into the microphone. First, I just have to say, I don't know. I hope that I'm speaking loud enough. Um, that it is phenomenal. Um, and uh, and very moving and so thoughtful. Um, so along that line, um, first of all, just to clarify, you keep talking about it in the present tense. You said that the area near there was was bombed, but I am assuming this was not damaged at, as of yet, um, which is amazing and fabulous. Um, how are the texts? You talked about the the visuals, the uh, the uh, the paintings, how they were chosen. How are the texts chosen? Um, so it's not damaged. Uh, it wasn't damaged in the in the attack, even though 150 meters from the synagogue, five people were killed uh, in this rocket attack. Uh, uh, and and this is of course uh, more tragic a loss than than loss of the building would have been. Uh, um, but uh, um, the texts are. Um, I can I can maybe uh, um, answer with a small anecdote. I was looking at uh, the historic uh, uh, photographs of the, these wooden synagogues and I was coming always back to a particular photograph um, that was particularly beautiful and it featured uh, a text uh, and my Hebrew is not very good so I asked a friend to, to translate or to identify what text it is. I, I would have assumed, I mean my Hebrew is good enough to, uh, that it's not the Shema Israel or, or something like this but uh, I would have assumed that it's uh, one of the main kind of prayers. Um, but in fact, it wasn't. Um, it was a, a, an obscure blessing going back to the Talmudic era about the interpretation of dreams. And it was about th that text on the wall of a, a 17th century uh, synagogue was a text about how to turn a nightmare into a good dream. Uh, and I thought this is such a, I don't know, stroke of luck or, or uh, the stars aligning in a good way that uh, this text should be the key text uh, because it's a leitmotif in a way of the synagogue. It, the synagogue um, is not uh, is also, of course, about commemorating a terrible massacre, but it's also about celebrating life and celebrating beauty. Uh, uh, how to turn a massacre into the future? How to open up a new future? Uh, so <coughs> this text that you see on the main wall is exactly this, this blessing of turning a, a nightmare into a kind of good dream. Uh, and then I took the liberty of choosing texts uh, uh, and or let's say proposing texts to the client uh, and, and uh, we have the, the um, morning blessing um, 
because it's awakening after sleep and sleep is a small death in, in Jewish or there's an interpretation of how sleep is a small death so it's again a kind of a reawakening um, and uh, so there's, uh, there's the Kaddish uh, um, uh, and, and these are the, the main texts that are on the wall. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, additional questions? I apologize if you already said this while you were giving us the tour. Um, I remember you saying how long it actually took to build, but I'm curious the timeline for the design from start to finish, how long did it take? It's a, a high fast, super fast uh, project. I received the telephone call in October 2020 and the building was finished, uh, not yet the painting, but the building was finished in April 2021. Uh, wow. Uh, yes. Sounds like a five-year project. Yes. No, it was uh, incredibly fast, uh, and uh, then it took another couple of uh, weeks or months to to paint it uh, completely. Uh, but uh, basically, within a, a month and a half, we had the design uh, more or less uh, more or less worked out, uh, and and started construction in February. Three teams working around the clock uh, in three locations uh, to build it in the fastest amount of time to meet uh, Yom HaShoah in uh, 2021. So the one of the kind of uh, commemoration dates for the Shoah, uh, for the Holocaust, uh, and, and then uh, eventually with the painting finished over the summer, uh, the 80th, uh, um, 80 year uh, commemoration in, in October. But even like prepping the ground, was that happening while this was all going on? Because when you look at the ground, you can't build on it as is. It would have all had to be flattened and... Yeah, um, yeah I mean, that, that was the main part of the design was how could we um, build the building without intervening much in the ground. And if you see, the white shouldn't be there. Uh, uh, if you kind of think away the white, the building is partially floating. You see this maybe if you... Um, <coughs> yeah, um, so the, uh, the, the, the building is partially floating. Uh, there's only a very thin uh, foundation, strip foundation, that digs in maybe 20 centimeters into the ground. And that was a very kind of difficult structural calculation to prevent it from slipping. Uh, uh, because we didn't want to disturb uh, the, the ground any further and even as I mentioned before we dug 20-25 centimeters and you find human bones. Excellent. Uh, one more question. Um, I had a question about uh, the process. Uh, over there you were talking about um, you, you know, we thought you'd use one color and then not a, another color. During the process of it, was there any major point, was there a point that you, that you really struggled with if you're gonna go down, go through door number A or door number B, like a fork in the road that you're trying to deal with an issue of something about, about the, the artwork itself that you really had a hard time? And if so, how did you resolve that? I, it's a difficult question, but um, and, and thank you for it. Um, I mean, first of all, it was so fast. We we uh, didn't have the um, uh, we we had to take decisions very rapidly. Uh, and and yes, the the artwork was uh, a, a little bit of a let's say I don't know struggle or or debate. Um, uh, and initially. I'm not Swiss, but uh, now I am Swiss, but I, 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 I'm not originally from Switzerland, but uh, you could say the kind of Swiss mentality of keeping it uh, slightly um, minimalist uh, initially uh, was, in my idea, on the foreground, ah, let's not make it too colorful, let's keep it a little bit more elegant, uh, uh, um, and, and I wanted a kind of a little bit more monochromatic uh, uh, color uh, um, range. And the client uh, and Ilya, uh, especially Ilya Krizanovsky, pressed for no. Let's make it colorful, more colorful, and and more, let's say, um, yeah, uh, more uh, um, brighter uh, also. And and uh, eventually he convinced me uh, towards the brighter and the more colorful side. And and this is the result. Uh, which is really a collaborative uh, uh, work where initially I resisted a bit and, and then uh, was convinced and, and I'm incredibly happy that he um, pressed uh, on this point. 
Excellent. And we have one last question. It's a, it's a beautiful synagogue. Thank you for sharing it with us. Does this project still occupy your dreams? I mean, it's a, um, it's a, I, I, I'm, I was and I am still incredibly, I don't know if, if honored is the right w word, uh, but yeah, in a way honored. Uh, uh, it's, uh, to build on, on Babinyar is, Babinyar is, is one of the, the, the kind of ground zeros, if one can use this word, uh, ground zeros of European history or world history of the 20th century. You know, it's one of the really important spots of the European continent where history is marked. Uh, and to be able to build on that is a huge responsibility and a huge honor. Uh, and uh, therefore, I, I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity that, uh, um, yeah, um, maybe I want to close with uh, uh, saying something that um, uh, I was incredibly, and I still am incredibly happy that things worked out so well. Uh, this is uh, due to fantastic team uh, locally. Uh, in my office, in Kiev, uh, engineers, builders, uh, uh, and so on. But it's also due to a very courageous clientele uh, or clients. Uh, now, Babinyar, um, the B Babinyar Foundation consists of, let's say, very, 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 very important and very, very, very wealthy uh, people. Uh, and often they're not known for courage. Um, prime ministers, billionaires and, and so on. Uh, um, it would have been so easy to slip into something more conventional, to slip into something more, something that uh, is maybe more like a conventional synagogue or something that is maybe more like a conventional memorial. Uh, but they had the courage to go uh, for, I hope I can say that, for a memorial that is unlike any other memorial and for a synagogue that is unlike any other synagogue. Uh, and to uh, take the courage to uh, build a, a structure uh, that is really a, a kind of a mechanical experiment. It worked out, it also could have failed, it didn't. Uh, um, but that the, the clients had the courage to support it uh, and to stick to it uh, is, is fantastic and uh, I'm incredibly thankful for them. Excellent. On that note, thank you so much, Manuel Hertz, for leading us around this exhibition. Thank you, everyone who has come. Uh, if you're not already aware, uh, tomorrow from 1 to 5 p.m., uh, we have a symposium at the Daniels Faculty Building at 1 Spadina Crescent, uh, during which uh, Manuel will speak, as well as Robert Jan van Pelt uh, and four additional scholars. Um, and uh, an additional programming still uh, in our roster. Uh, so please check out cofflerarts.org. Thank you.